Good morning. On April 21st, 2017, I went into labor while taking a final exam. Perhaps with a sprinkle of God's humor, I was taking a family law exam. And I remember using the computer to simultaneously type my essay answer and time my contractions. I was a 23-year-old student at Harvard Law School, and I hadn't spoken to my child's father since the day I told him I was pregnant. I arrived at labor and delivery with two requests or demands. An epidural, of course, and my laptop. Because I was so alone, I cried so hard that the nurses had to give me medication to go to sleep. But I didn't want to make excuses for myself. I finished that exam and had my daughter within the same hour. And this biting the bullet experience was quintessential for not only my upbringing, but my professional career with raising a child and practicing law. Again, I was determined not to let single motherhood deter me from graduating so learning to function while sleep deprived and nursing a child became my reality. Sometimes I couldn't cope with this reality and I would often fall into a deep depression. I never looked within, instead I fully de blamed this depression on the abandonment of my child's father. I placed this failed relationship in the quicksand of an array of disappointing relationships that seemed to shape my bitter outlook on reality. In 2018, I graduated from Harvard Law School with my daughter by my side. This actually went viral. And that same year, I passed the California bar on the first try, and I started working at a firm in LA. While everyone continued to celebrate me as the single mother who had finally conquered something, almost a token of the struggle child, my ambition and relentlessness was inspiration to others, I sunk deeper into my quicksand. I actually resented logging online every time and seeing that single mother graduates from Harvard Law School headline. I felt like the world had exposed me. I felt like the media and everyone else proponing this idea of a single mother and the struggle had finally found out my deepest secret. I was unlovable. From there, I sought to find my true happy ending. I wanted to show everyone that I could be loved and that I could find the true mark of success for me. I wanted a real family, and I was fixated on this fairy tale, so much that I continued to enter the revolving door of unhappy relationships, despite the growing impact that they had on my physical, mental, and emotional health. I begged these abusers to love me, and I even tried to help them. I went to therapy, I got on medication, I lost weight, I started drinking. Uh, I hated waking up in the morning, actually, to take the walk of shame through my own dignity. And eventually, I reached the point where I knew that I had to make a decision. Either I would stop depending on others to love me and take care of me and save me, or I would just lose everything that I'd worked for. So I started by looking in the mirror. In that simple gesture, I finally found the key to healing, and it was revolutionary. If you don't take anything away from this TED Talk, I want you to take this. Never enter into a relationship without this key. Self-love is a revolutionary act, and every single relationship and experience that we have is an encounter of nothing more than a mirror of you reflecting how you feel about yourself. The only way that I could overcome the toxic relationship that I had immersed my entire self in was to overcome the toxic relationship that I had with myself. These days, it's pretty easy to diagnose negative self-relationships. If the relationship that one has with oneself is negative, we can probably see it by how it's influencing every other area of their life. And this is because, again, every external relationship is just a reflection of the experiences that we have inside. And so we often gossip about it and talk amongst our friends, say, hey, this person, you know, they don't love themselves, or she doesn't love herself, you know, she's in this relationship and whatever else have you. It's super easy, actually, to point out when others allegedly don't love themselves but it's difficult to point that same thing out in ourselves. It's even more difficult to face the roots that shape our self-perception. Because our upbringing is the foundation of these relationship experiences, negative self-perception is commonly rooted in childhood trauma. Growing up, I don't think I knew what love was, and I don't think I knew what self-love was. 
I never understood the matrix of being in survival mode until I finally survived it, actually. I was born a statistic, and everyone had betted against my parents. They were teen parents, they had six children, and as a family, we overcame three evictions, at least two house fires, and one cross-country move. By my senior year, I'd been to seven different high schools in the span of four years, and I'd missed at least two months of school at one point because of a bout of homelessness, whereas we couldn't submit a proof of address to the guidance counselor's office. My body responded to such ongoing instability with crippling anxiety. I felt that my home life was constantly chaotic and was in a constant state of chaos with such a full house of people, the explosive arguments were so common that I actually ended up equating violence with conflict resolution skills. I was insecure. I had eczema. I had a bit of acne. I was a little overweight. I didn't want to be seen. My reflection was a constant reminder that I was not my mother's pretty child. I felt like I couldn't even be heard, especially not under the cacophony of my five brothers and sisters' voices and personalities, most or if not all of whom my parents will tell you were a lot more agreeable than mine. So I disappeared a lot. I disappeared into books. Books made me feel invisible, but alive. Books helped me shape the fairy tale of my life and what I wanted it to be. My understanding of love and relationships was therefore conceived in trauma, but birthed in how negatively I felt about myself in comparison to my siblings and others around me. At 16, I got an academic scholarship to go to St. John's. I packed one suitcase and one pair of shoes, but I had more baggage on that plane than would have actually been allowed. My first relationship in college was with a guy that I'd met at McDonald's, that one in uh, Times Square and 42nd Street. Uh, don't ever do that, just for future reference. <laughs> Never again. He worked there. But <laughs> um, I, I'd been carrying that load of invisibility and, and ugliness from my childhood on my shoulders for so long, and he actually took that weight off of me. He told me that I was pretty. And uh, long story short, I lost my virginity to the first person who told me I was pretty and made me believe that he didn't even stay around for that much longer. My next relationship was actually with someone who was already in a relationship. I guess I thought I did not deserve someone fully, so I was willing to beg for the scraps of his love and emotional unavailability. I suppose the next relationship after that was an upgrade uh, because I was the only woman, but uh, the person was so committed to me that he would wake me up strangling me if he found something in my phone that he didn't like, like me showing attention to anyone else. I equated that passion, I equated that violence to passion, and that was love, and that was the first man that I learned to fear. Addiction is dancing to the music even when it's no longer fun, and I was an addict at that point. I became intoxicated with these abusive partnerships, and when they ended, instead of healing the emotional hangovers, I continued to search for my fix in the love of, in the drug of my choice, which was the love of men who told me I was beautiful. I actually think I hit rock bottom recently, when I had my second child out of wedlock. I just knew that my son's dad was my final happy ending. My son's one, by the way, he just turned one. I love him. <laughs> Um, he didn't just tell me I was beautiful, but he actually promised me that family that I'd wanted my whole life, one that I'd be seen, heard in, and loved by. This time, single motherhood did not make the headlines, but for me, it, was just another, it wasn't just another failed relationship. This time, for me, it meant that I was actually a failure. The self-loathing overshadowed my entire pregnancy and exacerbated my grief in postpartum. I had graduated from Harvard Law, received business certifications, started companies, published books, submitted publications to international um, firms and such. I had even been on the board of a nonprofit super early on, but I could not get the one thing that I'd always wanted. No matter how many ceilings I shattered, how much income I made, no matter what I did, I could not seem to be loved. The only accomplishment that I ever dreamed of since childhood was having a stable, stable family, and that was something that I just couldn't seem to attain. This was at my lowest point, I think. Here's when I realized that I had to make the decision to come up for air, and I only had two choices. 
I could either choose to believe that I was a failure and then therefore become one, or I could take accountability for my healing. And for purposes of saving my children from this, I decided that I would heal. I mustered up the courage to finally look in the mirror at my reflection, and I realized why I'd prolonged it for so long. I could barely recognize myself under the disguise of materialism and under the disguise of the weight that I held on my shoulders. I decided from there to go forward and look, I decided from there to go forward and find myself and resolve my childhood traumas. Every time that, again, we're in a relationship, the experiences from the relationship shape our identity because they reflect back to us who we believe that we are. When I decided to, make, to take on the journey of healing, that's when I decided to look at myself and love myself in a revolutionary way so that every time I was in another relationship, it reflected back to me the love that I'd had for myself. I want you all to take this with you. This not only key that the revolution to self-love is necessary through your, for any successful relationship, I want you all to take this. Understand that when you love yourself, you shape the experiences that everyone, you shape the experiences and interaction that everyone else has with you. And that's how you can change the world. <laughs>